Okay. Good morning again, ladies and gentlemen. Again, you're here at the Miami Dade Commission on Ethics and Public Trust meeting. Today is November 14, 2013. It is now 10 a.m. Um, I'll be acting chair today. My, again, my name is Nelson Blue, I'm the vice chair of the, of the Commission on Ethics and Public Trust. We do have a quorum this morning, so we'll go ahead and proceed. The first order of business this morning is the approval of the minutes from the October 10, 2013 meeting. The second order of business today is the request for opinions, RQO 13-11. Good morning, commissioners. This uh, request comes from staff. There has been uh, some controversy over how the cone of silence has been interpreted uh, in a recent uh, solicitation uh, on behalf of the Water and Sewer Department. And we would like some clarification from you as to how to interpret uh, a particular part of the cone of silence. As you know, the cone of silence intends to pr protect the procurement process uh, from the time that the solicitation document is advertised until the mayor makes a recommendation to the Board of County Commissioners. In essence, in general, the cone prohibits private oral communications between many groups of people involved in the procurement <coughs> process. I'd like to call your attention to page two of my memo where I specifically point out that bidders are prohibited from communicating privately, orally, with the county's professional staff, including but not limited to the county mayor and his or her staff, any member of the selection committee, and the mayor, county commissioners, and their respective staffs. The language is a little um, confusing here because the cone was written when we had a um, uh, a county manager. Now the mayor has, we have the strong mayor uh, form of government. In any case, that, that general prohibition applies to many groups and they're specifically delineated in that first portion of the cone. There are many exceptions to the cone and the exception that has been called to our attention uh, recently is the one that allows communications if they are in writing and a copy is filed with the clerk of the board. You'll see that particular language uh, also on page two of the memo. You'll notice that the language in the exception is not as clearly delineated as it is in the initial part of the cone. It mentions um, Written communications will be allowed um, with any county employee, any official, and that's the problematic word here today, any official or member of the Board of County Commissioners, unless specifically prohibited by the solicitation document. The uh, cone has been in effect a long time, and the Ethics Commission, as well as the County Attorney's Office, has interpreted this particular exception to apply to all those people who were not, uh, who were delineated and uh, named in the original portion of the um, ordinance to now to allow those people who we talked about in the first part of the ordinance to now uh, allow communication between them as long as it's written and, and a public record is made with the clerk of the board. This seems to be a reasonable interpretation because communication is allowed in a public meeting among all these various uh, people involved in the procurement process. So it would seem that the intention of the exception is to allow communication between these same individuals in the written form as long as it's a public document. Uh, the, 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 uh, our interpretation has been questioned because 
official is not defined in the code. We believe the official means all of those individuals who were initially mentioned. But uh, we have been challenged on that because there is a solicitation, there is a selection committee now who, that's been called by the mayor in this particular solicitation. And four out of five of those members of the uh, selection <coughs> committee, I mean the selection committee uh, in, this pres in this solicitation, four of, of those five members of the selection committee are uh, citizen experts and they're not county employees. Uh, the question has arisen, are those citizen experts officials? We say they are officials because they're serving in a capacity to benefit the, uh, some official uh, benefit to the county. They've been called by the mayor. Official is generally defined as these kinds of people who are appointed, although they're not appointed board members and so on. They seem to us to be official officials. And I should mention, I didn't put it in my packet, but um, Mr. DeGrande provided you with a supplement. There is a resolution that uh, specifically names how these officials should be selected and uh, the standards that they must meet. And in that resolution, discussing uh, how to, to pro provide experts on, citizen experts on the selection committees, these citizen experts are required to comport with all county ordinance, and it says specifically, including the cone of silent, uh, the cone of silence of the ethics. Specifically, it says the uh, conflict of interest in ethics code. So we think these people are certainly captured uh, within the cone, and they can be consequently communicated with as long as it's done in a public mm -hmm. manner, as outlined in this exception. Ms. Friggin, so do you want to stop me. there and focus on the first question? Sure. And the second question, that's, that's the best word. Yes, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Is there any discussion on this issue? I should mention that the uh, interested, many interested parties are here in the audience and would like to make comments as well. It's your discretion. Very well. If you, sir, if you could identify yourself by name and title and any party that you represent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the record, my name is Miguel DeGrandi. My address is 701 Brickle Avenue, and I'm here on behalf of Pedro Hernandez, Vice President of AECOM. I'm here today with Professor Anthony Alfieri to address those two very important questions dealing with the implementation of the Cone of Silence, and because We're going to just address the first one, and we'll give you the opportunity to come back and address the second one. Okay. Um, I had, uh, if you'd like, we could do that. I had prepared a presentation which actually inverted the two questions, because I think they are more logically uh, set forth that way, but I will do. Well, why don't, why don't we do this in the interest of time? Ms. Frigo, why don't you go ahead and, and make your presentation as to the second question, and then we'll have Mr. DeGrande come back up. And then you Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, so they, we're still in that same exception. You notice that the provision allows for communications and writing as long as a copy is filed with the clerk of the board. However, if that solicitation document uh, prohibits such communication, then the language in the solicitation document would supersede the comb. So this takes us to look at the solicitation document in this case, and there are two places where, uh, uh, where uh, the manner in which documents can be submitted uh, are, are discussed. Um, I, this is on page four of my memo. Under section 2-2 of, um, of the solicitation document, it said interested firms must submit their proposals in sealed envelopes and or containers, and all sealed envelopes or containers shall be delivered to the clerk of the board. <clears throat> we consider that to be somewhat ambiguous about how subsequent documents are to be submitted to the selection committee or, or, or to, the, to the county, let's say. This, this section 2.2 seems to uh, refer to initial proposals, but it doesn't say if you have supplemental documents how you should, how you should submit them. Um, there's another section that talks about uh, uh, sending documents to the county. 
and section 1.13, confidential information is another method. And send it to the clerk who will redact it and then or, and then it can be su submitted to the commission uh, to the selection committee. So these are these two um, very brief passages are the only thing in the solicitation document to give any indication of whether uh, subsequent uh, documentation can be submitted in the in the manner under the cone. We find that those two brief passages are not clear about how to submit. Mr. I'm that. sorry to interrupt. I, I want to ask a question about, uh, uh, and, and I, I, I seem to get this both from the executive director's letter to the mayor and in the letter to uh, the executive director from Patrick Lou with respect to the discussion of the tier one and tier two evaluation process. Mm -hmm. That's not clear when I look at the, I, I, didn't, I didn't appreciate the distinctions that were being made in either of those discussions from 2.2 or 1.13. That is to say, I didn't appreciate the documents having articulated a tier one and tier two submission process. I don't believe that that's uh, articulated. So, yet we have, from at least from Patrick Lou and I, I get, I think, from the executive director, a discussion of at least how we might understand the document from some conception of what was to be submitted at tier one and what was to be submitted at tier two. Where, where is that communicated to the proposers? Well, that's exactly the problem. <laughs> we have, we're asking a general question about are written documents uh, uh, allowable uh, with a copy to the clerk. We've never had the particular question of how uh, large uh, the quantity of those documents and the timing of those documents and the extent of those documents. We haven't quite, and we, I'm, I'm not asking whether that if if it was allowed, if the submission in this particular case was appropriate, I think that's another question. No, I guess I guess, I guess to the point. My question is, if we are to understand two point two and one point one three as superseding whatever we might find in the cone of silence, wouldn't wouldn't that be affected by the tier one and tier two? That is saying, wouldn't if we if we if we under if we took all of that to be a part of what was communicated to the proposers, wouldn't that also affect our understanding of the cone of silence? That is saying, how 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 wide do we does the canvas sort of reach with respect to what gets communicated or what? Well, is the, uh, the cone of silence is in effect for a not the cone of silence. That is saying, how we interpret what was to be submitted at tier one and tier two, right? So you, if you said to us that the, the cone of silence might govern, but the cone of silence might be superseded by what is articulated in the bids. I got the impression from at least Patrick Lou's letter that whatever was articulated about a tier one and tier two submission gave the impression or should have given the impression that that all of the material should have been submitted at tier one and that at tier two there would simply be oral presentations. And I guess I'm just wondering, where is that? <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I, I think I can, I can help a little okay. bit on this. Uh, certainly it was understood that the written proposals would have been made at tier one um, and the, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the specs uh, certainly indicated that you know the, the submission was to be made at a certain time under seal and with a deadline and so forth. Now there was a reference to other uh, information that might be submitted at tier two when I think the words were when applicable. Uh, and I think that uh, you know it would be understood that if, if further information was requested uh, or desired or asked for, certainly that would create a situation where there would be further documentation uh, presented. It frankly was not clear from all of the the review I did of the of the specifications exactly what the limitations were on that. And that's the fundamental but, but, problem. But clearly, exhibits three and four don't 
don't state what you just said. That is to say, the, the tier one, exhibits three and four don't articulate a tier one and tier two. No, and, I, and I, but I, as I said, I don't think that that's clearly articulated. I think, I think the, the, the understanding okay. from the document was that, yes, we, we're going to submit this at tier one, and there was some reference to when applicable, there could be other information submitted at tier two. The problem was the tier two um, is a presentation, oral presentation. It was not made clear at all from the documents. I think my, my opinion, as well as uh, the, uh, the other uh, available document, made clear that it wasn't defined exactly under what circumstances and to what extent further information could be submitted at tier two. And, that, and that's really a defect in the process. Well, I guess as a first question, I don't even see, I don't even see anything that talk, talks about tier one and tier two. So is there ever a, is there a document, because it doesn't seem like exhibit three or four, are, so is there? There, and is, I guess there is the entire spec document that okay. we didn't include, oh, okay. it's about okay. an inch thick. Uh, okay. So but we have that certainly available, and we have that if, if the commission wants to review that. I guess I was just, given the, given the fact that references were made to what seemed to be articulated to the proposers, when the, the spec documents discuss the tier one, tier two process, I guess I was just looking for what exactly was was stated so that I could kind of get a, get, get a better sense of, of that. Okay. Uh, commissioners, if I could just introduce you, Hold on one second. One, uh, Mr. Johnson. Yes, I'm just introduce myself, Al Dotson. and I represent CH2M Hill. Uh, I also, too, would like to make a presentation after Mr. DeGrandy, but on this specific point, may I just add uh, one item. There is an administrative order that Miami-Dade County adopted as it relates to Tier 1 and Tier 2 submittals. And I'm going to read from you what Tier 2 submittal actually says with respect to the very question on the table. Tier 2 selection. Tier 2 evaluation provides an opportunity for the top firms identified in the first tier selection to submit additional information and may involve an oral presentation. That is the administrative order of Miami-Dade <coughs> County as it relates to a Tier 1, Tier 2 uh, process. So it is not simply a presentation. It may be a presentation, but certainly it says here you can submit additional information in the administrative order. I've got a lot more on this topic, but I didn't want that to go unstated that there is an administrative order on this very issue uh, with respect to what can be submitted in the... Mr. Johnson, just for the record, who do you represent? CH2M Hill. Thank you, and we will allow you to make your presentation. Um, Mr. Grandy, we're going to allow you to make your presentation if you have a statement to make in and To address that limited point, the administrative order that Mr. Dodson read also says at the beginning that it is advisory only and it may be superseded by the solicitation document. The solicitation document in this case at section 1.7 gives only one proposal deadline. And it, there is important language in section 2.2 that says, to avoid a late proponent from gaining an advantage, economic or otherwise, all submittals must be tendered by the due date. The only way to understand those two provisions is that there's only one submission deadline. Otherwise, the second statement regarding a late proponent makes no sense whatsoever if you could do a second one whenever you please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Green. And I'm going to pass my imaginary gavel back to the chair. I, don't know if it's I guess I just, I would, especially if this is good. For, just for the purposes of the committee, if, if we might get a copy of, of, of 1.7, if, if, if just to get a, get a look at whatever the, whatever the specific uh, language in the inspect uh, document uh, is. Ms. Frigo, I'm sorry. I, I guess I wanted to ask um, ask you to, um, at least for, for the benefit of the staff going forward, we're very particularly interested to have a clear understanding of what official refers to in that ex exception. Um, and um, many of the other um, facts that have occurred in this particular solicitation um, may not necessarily re, you know, uh, have impact on our, our, our general understanding of official. So I wanted to, to limit, limit us to that. Well, I, I think that would the, be helpful. I, I think Commissioner Bolito was, was correct. I, 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 if, uh, 
uh, if there are presentations with respect to the to the to the scope of of, of who falls within that term of official, uh, we we are open to hearing uh, presentations on, on, on that question. This time. Oops, Mr. Chairman, if I may, uh, how I've structured my presentation is to respond to the two questions, actually inverting them, because I think what's important is number one to determine whether the exception applies, and if uh, it does apply, whether these individuals were officials. Now. Commissioners, these questions are before you as a result of a complaint filed by Mr. Hernandez close to two months ago and deal with how the exception to the cone of silence operates based on a specific set of facts. They cannot be analyzed in a vacuum. The exception, as your staff has told you, allows communications in writing with county employees, <coughs> officials, and members of the Board of County Commissions, three classes of individuals with a copy to the clerk of the board, unless, of course, it is prohibited by the solicitation document. The exception does not require the prohibition in the solicitation document to be expressed in any particular manner. Now, the subject procurement contains two provisions that have been referenced which make clear that the delivery of a proposal to selection committee members is prohibited. The first section is section 2.2, which sets forth an exclusive method of delivery of submittals. It states that all submittals must be in a sealed envelope and shall be delivered to the clerk of the board to the attention of the procurement officer. It provides no language that allows any other method whatsoever of delivery. The second section is section 1.3, which deals with confidential information. Now, this section creates a uniform methodology for vetting proposals, which requires county staff for every proposal to review the submission and redact any material that is inappropriate or deemed confidential. Now, obviously, the purpose of this provision is to ensure that the evaluation committee is not exposed to information which it cannot consider in its evaluation. And therefore, right in conjunction with each other, it is clear that the only way for county staff to perform the analysis required in section 1.13 is if section 2.2 actually provides an exclusive methodology for submission of proposals that prohibits <coughs> direct delivery of proposals to selection committee members. Now, indeed, in his report to the mayor, Mr. Santorino even states that, and I'll quote, admittedly, it is difficult to understand how this provision could be effective or meaningful if it were permissible for proposers to submit such information directly to selection committee members, unquote. Now, in contrast, with all due respect, your staff attorney's memo sidesteps this point by arguing that there is no explicit prohibition on a subsequent delivery of non-confidential materials directly to committee members. Now, that argument, with all due respect, has two basic flaws. First, it ignores the fact that the whole purpose of Section 1.13 is to create a uniform methodology for vetting all proposals prior to those proposals being delivered to selection committee members. The second problem with that is that the methodology suggested by your staff attorney would actually shift the decision-making authority to determine what can properly be considered by the committee from county staff to the proposer. Now, here's where the facts become relevant in this case. To further illustrate the flaw, with all due respect, of your staff attorney's argument, there is an eight-page section in CH2M Hill's submission that had the following heading. Quote, the program management framework is CH2M Hill's proprietary program management system. Now, should that information, which is proprietary and therefore confidential, have been redacted from the proposal? And to make sure that the committee was not exposed to it? Frankly, I don't have the answer, but I am not supposed to give the answer. That is not a proposer's decision to make. That is the decision that county staff was not able to make because CH2M violated the provisions that created an exclusive methodology for delivery of submissions. Now, commissioners, when there is an argument of ambiguity, one of the things you have to look at is how the bidder community in general interprets the provision using your common sense and how persons accused of violating the provision understood it. And again, the specific facts become critical in this matter. Because in this matter, county staff has asserted 
that delivering submissions directly to selection committee members is unprecedented, and I believe Mr. Santorino can verify that. And that means that in, the, in every other a <coughs> procurement in the history of the county, including the previous ones that TH2M Hill participated in, everyone apparently understood that there was an exclusive method of delivery of submissions which required proposers to tender submissions only to the clerk of the board. Moreover, the facts in the particular case regarding Mr. Hernandez's complaint demonstrate that the subject of the complaint knew the protocol for vetting proposals and actually articulates it in a letter five days before he chose to violate it. Now, on August 22, Counselor for CH2M Hill sent a letter to the county attorney's office complaining about my client's submission, how it was handled, and asserting that a section on project approach in a e submission should have been redacted from the proposal so it would not be considered during the Tier 1 evaluation. And in that correspondence, he makes the following enlightened statements. He states, quote, in past procurements, if items were submitted that were not required in solicitation or that did not meet the solicitation guidelines, County Internal Services Department removed the unnecessary pages prior to the selection committee members receiving the proposal for evaluation. And he goes on to state that, quote, as in past situations, the unnecessary pages should have been omitted by ISD staff prior to these two proposals being submitted to the selection committee for review. And so, commissioners, there is no way to accomplish the process he describes himself unless there is an exclusive methodology for delivery of proposals which prohibits direct delivery to selection committee members. Simply stated, that is the only way to ensure that staff can conduct the review required in 1.13 before the submission is given to selection committees. Therefore, the evidence shows that council understood the exception to the count of silence and that it did not apply in this case. Now, as to the second point, even assuming that the exception applied, which it clearly does not, CH2M would still have violated the tone of silence because it delivered its submission to individuals not covered by the exception. Now, the exception allows communications and writing only to, quote, county staff, officials, and members of the BCC. Again, the facts are critical in this case because on July 2nd of this year, the Board of County Commissioners passed an extraordinary resolution requiring, quote, outside independent experts, unquote, to serve on these selection committees. And the resolution states that, quote, the outside independent experts shall serve in a volunteer capacity. Now, moreover, both counsel for CH2M Hill and the mayor refer to these individuals in their correspondence as, quote, non-county members, unquote. Now, clearly, with all due respect, you cannot be a volunteer outside independent expert or a non-county member and be a county official all at the same time. Now, to prove that point, let's just use common sense and go to the common dictionary definition of those words. If you go to dictionary.com, it defines the word outside as external or exterior. It defines the term independent as, quote, not subject to another's jurisdiction, autonomous, or free. And it defines the term, quote, volunteer as, quote, a person whose actions are not founded on any legal obligation so to act. And likewise, the term non, as used in the phrase non-county members, is defined as, quote, a prefix meaning not, as in not a member of the county and therefore not a county official. Now, even for those of us who learned English as a second language, I respectfully submit there is nothing ambiguous about those terms. You'd admit that uh, members of a committee selecting uh, those who would perform a government contract are making public decisions? No, and let me tell, let me tell you why. The members of a selection committee's primary responsibility is to recommend legislation or official action to the Board of County Commissions. A selection committee member makes a non-binding recommendation which may be ignored by the mayor or may be rejected by the mayor. And so one of the things that's important in determining whether someone is an official is whether they hold office or have authority to take official acts. 
and to your point, which I think is very relevant, these individuals do not hold office. Your staff attorney kind of bootstraps that concept by saying, well, they work under the office of the mayor, but they do not hold office. And the question then becomes, do they have authority to take any official acts? The only thing that these individuals can do is make a non-binding recommendation to the mayor, which can be completely disregarded. And therefore, the evidence shows that they have no authority whatsoever to make any official acts. Now, in summary, and then I'd like to uh, pass the remainder of my time to Professor Alfieri, the facts in this case, and common sense, and I, and I will tell you, I've been practicing law now going on 33 years. I've had the pleasure of taking at least 60 jury trials to verdict. And in every one of those cases, there's a jury instruction that asks jurors to use your common sense. Common sense dictates that the exception to the common silence could not possibly apply in this case, and that even if it did, volunteer outside independent experts on selection committees were clearly not part of the limited class of individuals covered by the exception. I thank you for your attention. I would like to have Professor Alfieri finish our presentation. Thank you. I've been asked by um, Genevieve Joblove and Batista, as well as Helen and Knight, to address the ethical ramifications and the policy consequences of the issues that are before the commission. Unsurprisingly, um, as you know from my October uh, uh, memorandum that was submitted, I assume the commission has had an opportunity to review it. Um, my uh, conclusions uh, uh, are largely in accord with the executive director's uh, conclusions regarding uh, the um, uh, integrity of the process uh, in this selection process, as well as the competitive advantage and disadvantage uh, consequences. Um, I'm sorry, before you go on, you didn't tell us your full name, sir. It's uh, Professor Anthony Alfieri at the University of Miami School of Law Center for Ethics and Public Service. The, um, the memo speaks for itself. Uh, let me uh, break down uh, some uh, key uh, points in the memorandum and also address uh, Ms. Frigo's uh, recent memorandum. Uh, the memorandum addresses four quick points. Um, one, uh, whether there are any uh, process-based integrity issues, whether there are any outcome-based integrity issues, uh, whether there are any uh, cost or transactional efficiency consequences, as well as um, issues of moral hazard. Um, uh, let's start with process-based integrity issues. Uh, the ordinance um, uh, that this commission uh, oversees and the solicitation document um, in controversy creates a gatekeeping function. The purpose of the gatekeeping function is to uh, limit the disclosure and use of confidential information that might advantage or disadvantage one of the proposers. Uh, it is to um, uh, detect and avoid conflicts of interest that may result in the selection process. And it's also to rely on the expertise of uh, county personnel um, who provide a filter and a gatekeeping function in allowing uh, materials to be distributed to the selection committee. It's a very straightforward process and um, has significant in, uh, efficiency savings um, as a result. Um, the, um, in, in that analysis um, uh, also applies to outcome-based integrity issues in this case. Um, the analysis that Ms. Frigo presents regarding the construction of the term official um, proves too much. Um, there are no limiting principles and uh, in applying a, 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 an extremely overbroad construction to the, um, to the term official and undermines all of the gatekeeping functions that your ordinance, the selection process, and the solicitation document erect. That is to say, if you follow Ms. Frigo's analysis, um, confident, uh, the decision-making re regarding confidential documents, the decision-making re regarding conflicts of interest, um, will in fact be shifted away from county personnel and be put in the hands of the proposer. So the proposer has an opportunity, therefore, to engage in what we would call, under moral hazard analysis, risk-taking or rule-breaking behavior, what we would consider bad behavior. And so the structure that Ms. Frigo is, is uh, essentially 
actually engrafting over the current ordinance and the current solicitation document is going to incentivize behavior that either um, tries to bend rules or break rules, uh, as in this case. Um, the issues that uh, are particularly concerning regarding Ms. Frigo's um, uh, definition of official is that it is so significantly overbroad it raises two um, quick questions. For example, um, does the county's insurance carrier understand that all members um, uh, uh, beginning on the, uh, on the date that Ms. Frigo's analysis and definition of officials takes effect, that from that point on all members of these independent um, citizen selection committees are going to fall within the coverage of the county's liability insurance. Um, that's a significant consequence um, for the county. Certainly it's a significant cost consequence, and it has significant legal ramifications for, um, for the county. Uh, Ms. Frigo doesn't address that significant issue. Also, uh, from a litigation standpoint, whether it's federal or state litigation, if Ms. Frigo's analysis is adopted in this case, then that presumably means that that provides a defense to all of these selection committee members in any kind of federal or state litigation where they're named as a defendant, and therefore they will invoke, presumably, the defense of qualified immunity. Ms. Frigo does not address that issue as well. So uh, the consequences are significant, not only for um, uh, moral hazard and encouraging bad behavior by proposers by undermining the gatekeeping function that this commission has established and the solicitation document establishes, but then it creates significant issues of qualified immunity and significant issues um, for the county's insurance carrier, which, which Ms. Frigo doesn't address. Um, in addition, on the, uh, on the construction, the Tier 1, Tier 2 uh, analysis, and the, and the uh, definition of the methodology for providing um, additional information to the selection committee under 2.2 and 1.13, um, I, 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 I confess that I, I depart with Ms. Frigo again. Um, the solicitation document is very clear um, in terms of um, what is permitted and what is, uh, and what is impermissible um, in terms of communicating with the selection committee. And, um, and, uh, and any law school course on administrative law or statutory construction or legislation will, will teach you that to go with the plain meaning of, um, of the statute, the plain meaning of the rule. In this particular case, um, the meaning is plain. Uh, I, I, I confess I'm baffled by Ms. Frigo's analysis in, this, in the sense that um, it appears to be engaging in a very highly strained and attenuated analysis um, of, of, of what appears to be a, um, a, a very straightforward uh, document. Um, again, if that analysis goes forward in this case, it undermines the gatekeeping function that the ordinance um, is intended to implement and uh, that's reinforced by the solicitation document, which is to um, filter out confidential communications that would go, that would competitively advantage one proposer over another, um, and also uh, uh, detect and limit and clear out conflicts of interest, and again, uh, for efficiency and cost saving purposes, um, allow the process to run through um, the uh, system that the Commission um, has erected in this particular case. Um, what's most distressing, and then I'll, 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 I'll stop to permit the Commission to ask questions. Um, what's most distressing um, from uh, uh, a policy standpoint and an ethics um, standpoint is that is this issue of moral hazard, and, and this issue is very common um, in the in the insur insurance industry. It goes back two centuries um, uh, to English common law. Um, the the basic point is this: if you let bad behavior go forward, and in fact you cushion that bad behavior by not penalizing it, um, then that bad behavior is going to continue. And you are essentially, um, uh, uh, and, and moreover, that bad behavior shifts the burden, for example in this case, the burden in terms of transaction costs um, uh, will shift over to ACOM because if the, if, if, if the, uh, if the mayor and this commission decides to start um, uh, from square one, all of those transaction costs are going to be uh, uh, shifted 
one to the other proposer, um, who is blameless in this particular case, and it's going to be shifted to um, the county and the citizens of this county who are going to have to bear the cost of, uh, of um, uh, renewing a process that was undermined by the deliberate intentional behavior of the representatives of the other proposer. And from any kind of um, uh, process or outcome-based analysis or moral hazard analysis or cost efficiency analysis, um, that is an unfair and, and unjust result. And I'll stop there. Are there any questions? <coughs> I guess I have a couple. That is, um, the to the extent that 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 we accept or I accept the the, the, the consequences of a broad reading of the language, um, right? They're no broader than the official role that any particular official would, in fact, undertake, right? That is to say. An assertion of qualified immunity, a, a, a potential liability for which a county might be on the hook or the county's insurance company might be on the hook, would itself simply be limited to the role undertaken by the by the private citizen, right? Um, and 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 in that respect, one could imagine that simply being the cost that the county is willing to bear for what might appear to be a more open decision-making process, right? That is to say that, that as soon as you invite private citizens in, these are the, the risks that, that, that exist and, 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 and that's a, that might be a policy decision in some sense above our pay grade. I would say that the, that the, that the, that the, the Board of County Commissioners might accept that as a consequence for what they consider to be a, a more open democratic governance stance? Well, in, in, I, I, it's a good question, and I, I understand the public-private distinction and, um, and, uh, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the policy um, uh, argument. The, the difficulty here is that um, if Ms. Frigo is, um, is asserting that there's sufficient uh, vagueness or ambiguity in the definition of, of, of official, um, then, the, then the, the, the stock canons of statutory construction that federal courts and state courts use on an, every, on an everyday basis across the nation um, uh, look to other um, uh, intrinsic or extrinsic materials that would help inform the definition of, well, what do we mean by official? It's a fair question. Um, so it seems to me that if all the, if the members of the, if Ms. Frigo's analysis carries the deck, if all, and, and, and because, because she proves too much, and because there are no limiting principles, um, the analysis of this commission goes, uh, goes way beyond the selection committees. Um, so that is to say, uh, uh, the, the county will have to revisit the status of all private citizens that are participating in some um, uh, county uh, policy making um, function. So, so, so this does open Pandora's box, and, and it seems to me that the furies that are going to fly out of the box include um, uh, materials that Ms. Frigo omits. For example, um, it seems to me that if Ms. Frigo is going to reach this conclusion, it's important to sit down uh, prior to putting pen to paper and consult with the county's insurance carrier or multiple insurance carriers and, and understand the, leg the, the history of that insurance. For example, has there been any discussion of defining these private citizens as officials? If, if the county, historically, um, uh, as well as the insurance carrier, have reached the conclusion uh, to date, and and there's and, and again, there's no citation in Ms. Frigo's memorandum. But if if the if the conclusion today and historically is well, no, these selection committee uh, members uh, are not in fact um, state official uh, county officials uh, because we're not insuring them. That would seem to me to be relevant um, to uh, to her analysis. And furthermore, and to the best of our knowledge, they are not um, within the coverage of the insurance carrier. And, um, and furthermore, on, 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 on the issue of qualified immunity, the consequences 
um, to the county in terms of cost of defining a, an, a, at the moment, because Ms. Frigo doesn't, uh, doesn't define it, um, the boundary lines, of defining an infinite and elastic class of private citizens who participate in county functions um, and, and analyzing that class of citizens as entitled in every case to qualified immunity, the, um, the potential liability to the county um, based on that definition um, are, uh, are extraordinary. And um, and uh, impose dramatic uh, cost burdens uh, to the county, which I presume is precisely why the county, to date, has not defined those selection committee members as officials in order to avoid the avoid the higher costs of insurance and to avoid the potentially unlimited liability issues raised by a qualified immunity defense. Professor, I want to stop there, Ms. Frigo. What is your Response. I know you've sat there patiently, but I, I, I'm interested in knowing if you're looking at, at this issue, the professor certainly challenged you on the issue of liability to the county. Is that something that you considered? I mean, it's not in the, at least the papers I've read. Is I, it something I, that should be looked into? I, I don't think it's, it's relevant, uh, Commissioner. Why is that? Um, we have, um, we, we're simply saying that there are, we have many advisory boards and other people who serve volunteer, voluntarily by the county. I, I, I don't know their status on their are in liability insurance, but uh, this is this would be something similar to what we have hundreds of hundreds and hundreds of people who do through the county. Here, here's here's the real crux of the of the issue. If citizens on selection committees cannot be communicated with this way but employees of the county can be communicated with. The, the question is, it's, it, it, are, are bidders allowed to communicate with the county employee who's on the selection committee, but not on the, and not on the citizen uh, who serves on the selection committee? That's really an absurd conclusion. Either selection committee, whoever they are, are part of the people who are uh, <coughs> required to be uh, contacted or, or, or prohibited from being contacted. I prefer you came to a conclusion that said um, everyone, uh, the employee, the official, the commissioners may be contacted by written communication except for all selection committee members. I, if you want to go that way, it would make more sense. They should. We should not be distinguishing between advisory um, uh, uh, citizens who are advisory and and, and county employees but I, 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 I do want to sort of go back to the to the to, to, to the other question uh, which is and, and 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 again as I understand it right uh, right administrative law officials are people who exercise government authority Right, and so, so, so the, the, in my mind, to my mind, the key question is whether or not these are actors who exercise government authority. These people are standing in the shoes of the mayor. They are helping the mayor make a decision. Yes, they are. Right. How do, how do we think about that in terms of the, the, the sort of binding, non-binding nature of their assistance? There, are, we have numerous advisory committees that have no binding authority. Numerous. And the question would be, are they are they then officials? We, uh, we consider them officials. We have them file financial disclosure. We haven't gone that far with selection committee members because they serve for a short period of time, under a year, usually. Uh, so they wouldn't be a board member as per the county code. But uh, in every other way, they are serving in a similar capacity, doing a public work doing uh, on, on behalf of the people of the county uh, and and the resolution that <coughs> delineates how they should be chosen and how they should be served specifically says they are subject to all county ordinances in, including the county ethics code it's specific can I, can I just forgive me uh, um, yeah. uh, Ms. Frigo uh, uh, illustrates the weakness of her own argument by observing that hundreds of 
private citizens are going to be swept into her definition of what it means to be an official under her analysis. And the policy consequences of that position are enormous and have consequences for uh, not only insurance, but liability issues um, for this county. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. If you could keep it brief. I'd like yes, to I, I have certainly would. I wanted just to address that brief point because okay. I think Ms. Frigo also hit a point that is critical. There is a definition in your code about advisory personnel, and those individuals are captured in the financial disclosure requirements. Your officials are the ones that have to file financial disclosures. Never once has any member of the selection committee been tasked with filing financial disclosure. And so the, the conclusion is either this commission has failed respectfully in its obligation to require officials to file financial disclosures, or they're not officials. Because there's not one official, there's not one selection committee member that has ever had to file a financial disclosure, whereas advisory personnel, which are a defined term in the ordinance, are compelled to file financial disclosure. Is that correct? We have many, an advisory board is defined in the county code as a, as a group of citizens meeting for longer than one year. If they meet for longer than one year, we require them to file financial disclosure. We have numerous committees that meet for less than one year. They do not file financial disclosure, but they serve in a similar capacity and give advice to the county. And would you, would you consider them officials? In, in a very general way, yes. I think official, and, and you know, official is a word that's not even used very much in our state, let alone in our jurisdiction, in the sense that they are uh, standing in the shoes of government well, what, but, but again, that, but again that, the, the question of standing in the shoes of government suggests to me that they are exercising governmental authority. And at, that, at, that at some point, there is an exercise of governmental authority if you are, in fact, in the shoes of, of government. I guess, again, from a factual perspective, um, the, the, the question with respect to this particular committee is, to the extent, if I if I am to accept what has been submitted, to the extent that they might be completely ignored by the decision maker, without the responsibility or the obligation to articulate justifications or reasons for not acting as recommended, the question it seems to me is: Are they exercising governmental authority? To what extent are they standing in? the shoes of some you know, charter-recognized official in our government. Yes, it's true they do not have binding authority, but they have many responsibilities that are held to a very high standard in terms of their conflicts and, and fairness and, and so on. Uh, not every decision is a binding if decision. I could, if I could add something, Mr. Chairman, um, that I mean, the, the, the mayor creates this board and invests it with the authority to conduct a procedure that's outlined in, in county documents, and they're, they're invested with that authority. Now, as I understand it, and I don't spend a lot of time over there, but I understand that the mayor has never not followed the recommendation of a selection committee. That's um, correct. I think, I think that, I mean, that's what I was told, and, and it certainly is, would be a very rare thing for him to do so. So I think that would indicate the, the, the importance of, of a selection process. In fact, we wouldn't be here if a selection committee were not invested with significant uh, authority, uh, official authority, uh, if it were simply you know, something that was going to be likely uh, ignored. I mean, it, 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 it does have a very important place in the decision-making authority, and the mayor has given it that authority. One last point, if I may. In this specific case, I obtained from public records of the mayor's office 10 different drafts of a recommendation rejecting all bids, which means that he was ignoring the committee's recommendation. Thank you. Let me just repeat, uh, just for the record, Al Dotson. I happen to represent uh, CH2M Hill. It's unfortunate that you find yourself in the middle of what has now become a bid protest, uh, and we've gotten into issues of insurance and uh, all kinds of issues that go well beyond 
uh, this particular opinion. I was going to start at the beginning, but unfortunately to start where uh, they just ended. Uh, there are a lot of things I need to do to correct the record. Uh, first of all, selection committees absolutely have the authority to recommend to the mayor either a order of negotiation or a winner in a process. And if the mayor wants to go against the selection committee's decision, he must justify it, not simply ignore it, not simply with the, and in fact, in fact, you just heard about 10 drafts of recommendations to reject all bids. They weren't simply a one line, I reject all bids, and I don't need to explain why. In fact, the selection committee, once they issue their recommendation, that becomes the subject of much discussion. It oftentimes ends up in a bid protest, what the selection committee does, why they did it, and there are countless cases, uh, both uh, state procurement and uh, local procurement law, dealing with the selection committee acting reasonably, that the mayor can't simply reject their opinion without a rationale. He does not have the exclusive authority to just do what he wants regardless of what the selection committee says. That's the law, and that's why they are officials. Number two, you were also told after I gave you the administrative order that expressly states that submissions are to come as part of Tier 2, that somehow it didn't apply. That's not right. In the Notice to Professional Consultants on page 13 of 33, there's a list of all the administrative orders that apply in this particular procurement. If you receive a copy of my uh, October 7th letter uh, to Mr. Centurino, it was behind tab D. And behind tab D, at the very top, is a list of all the administrative orders that apply in this particular case. And listed there is 3-39, Standard Process for Construction of Capital Improvements, Acquisition of Professional Services, Construction Contracting Change Orders, and Reporting. That is precisely the kind of procurement that's moving forward here. So when I read you that additional information is to be submitted as part of Tier 2, it wasn't my imagination. It wasn't in theory. It applied in this particular case. Now let me give you the facts that have not been presented to you because unfortunately this has become a bid protest without all of the facts associated with the bidding process. This is what actually happened. A notice to professional consultants is very different from an invitation to bid, which I'm sure you've heard about, an RFP, which I'm sure you've dealt with many uh, countless times, but the Tier 1, Tier 2 process is very specific. There's a state statute that deals with procuring these types of services, Section 287.055, and this administrative order that I gave you, A-3-39, was adopted for the sole purpose of this type of procurement. During the Tier 1 process, the sole question is, are you minimally qualified, and can we then put you on a short list? That's what's to happen as part of Tier 1. So the whole discussion about the proposals being submitted at a particular time, and I'll come back to that in a second, deals with what you must submit for the selection committee to determine who makes the short list. If you don't make the short list, then what you present as part of Tier 2 is wholly irrelevant. So much so that the last 20 notices to professional consultants issued by Miami-Dade Water and Sewer Department, all 20 of them, not some of them, not the majority of them, not one or two of them, all had submissions as part of the Tier 2 process. This is not abnormal. This is the norm, and it's set forth in the administrative order. The next thing that I need to clarify for you, it's been stated multiple times that this